Hey y'all, welcome back for the end of part one for week number 20 in Bio 20. Week number 20. Week number 10 in Bio 20. We're going to look at inheritance patterns in humans and pedigrees. So you should be able to construct a pedigree and use it to answer some really simple problems and explain how sex linked traits don't follow normal genetic patterns. Pedigrees are organized charts that help us understand how inheritance works in humans. And the reason why we have to do this is it's kind of unethical to force people to have certain types of crossings. So you can't just say, you two, make some kids so that we can analyze the genetics. We actually have to just wait for it to happen and look backwards in time. So we organize pedigrees using a whole bunch of symbols. Some of the symbols don't match modern thought, but we run with it, namely because pedigree analysis can be complicated on its own so we try and simplify things if we possibly can so what are those symbols we're going to reduce everyone to being male or female and if it doesn't matter we use a diamond shape if we call you a male we're going to use a box if it's a female we're going to use a circle and again if we don't know or it doesn't matter we use a diamond what you'll see is a lot of the time I will use diamonds when I do these simply because it's irrelevant to know. If you, for whatever trait we're looking at, if you have it, we fill in your box or your circle or your diamond. Properly speaking, you should half fill out the box or diamond or circle if you are what we would call a carrier or your heterozygous. In professional Pedigrees, this is done typically in school. We don't do that, but if you were to professionally have one of these made, this is what would happen. If you're dead, we put a slash through you. Here it says marriage is a line. What we mean to say is you're having kids. If you have kids, if there's a mating, we put a line. If it is with, if that mating is occurring between relatives, we call it being consanguineous, and that uses a double line. If you have non-identical twins, so maternal twins, we use a split like that. And if you're identical, so you're fraternal twins, we mark it down with also another line saying that you're effectively the same individual. When we look at pedigrees, we do start to see patterns that emerge. So for example, we can find traits that are dominant because if an individual has it, at least one of the parents will also have it. So dominant trait, if you have it, one of your parents has to have it. At least one of your parents. It could be both. Recessive traits, on the other hand, can skip, meaning if you have it, it is possible that your parents don't have it. What makes this difficult to do in real life is recessive traits can look like this. So that's perfectly possible because you just keep passing on the recessive traits. What you can't do is have a dominant follow the second pattern. So usually if we're working a problem in, you know, in here or in another type of class, we would have it rigged so you can obviously tell what's going on or we have to flat out tell you it's dominant and recessive. In reality, it's a bit more complicated, which is usually why pedigrees are huge charts, because we need to get as much data as we can to determine are we really seeing the correct pattern. Because we can't tell by this if you're dominant or recessive, meaning homozygous or heterozygous, unless we have lots of information. Once we have that, it's now possible for us to assign genotypes. So I could say that this person here must be a big A. These two individuals here must also be a big A. I can't say if they're homozygous or heterozygous. Although, upon further review, I can start to figure that out. So this individual here has to be recessive because it doesn't have it, which means these two parents need to also be recessive. Or excuse me, they're both heterozygous. Here, on the other hand, for this individual to show it, 
the person must be recessive, which means the parents must be heterozygous. And yet again, I don't know what's going on with that other individual. I just know there's at least one dominant allele. So we can use these to solve problems. So for example, is this trait dominant or recessive? So what we have to do is look for everyone who has it and check their parents. So does this individual have someone who has, has a parent who has it? Yes. Does this individual have a parent who has it? Yes. Does this individual have a parent who has it? Yes. How about for these two? Yes. I don't ever see an exception to this. So we are inclined to say this is a dominant trait. So now we can apply a problem to it. So person 3, 1, who is this individual right here, wants to have kids with person 3, 6. So this would be a consanguinous mating because this is within cousins. So that would be, you know, judge as you will. It's legal in California. What are the odds of them having an unaffected child? So what we have to do is we have to start figuring out what's going on. So for this person here, since we think this is a dominant disorder or a dominant trait, I need to assign genotypes. And since we think it's dominant, person 3-1 is recessive. And person 3-6 is also recessive. So what are the odds of them having an unaffected child? Well, the odds would be 100% that they don't have an affected child because neither of them has the allele to pass on. So it does make it sometimes pretty simple. Sometimes we have traits that are associated with one sex. I know, I know, I know, I know. Sex is not gender. Gender is a human society thing. Sex is what's going on with sperm or egg. We like to say that sex is male, female, meaning sperm maker or egg maker. The problem is it's not always that simple. We would like to assume that's the case, but it's not always that simple. We're just going to run and unfortunately be sloppy with our language and kind of merge back and forth between sex and gender, even though it's wrong to do it because it, it's actually wrong by definition. It's just I'm lazy with my words and the more I try and catch myself, the worse I'm going to get. So I'm just letting it out now. I'm going to be sloppy with my language, so please forgive me. What we can notice is if I look at these two genes, or these two pedigrees, we get some weird patterns of a female can get give it to her son, give whatever this trait is to her son, and the son only gives it to the female offspring. What this means is this trait is something that can only go from mother to son and son to daughters. That is the pattern that exists. So it can go from female to male only, and it goes from male to female only. This can be explained by using chromosome symbols. Females are XX, males are XY. Again, we're going very broad strokes. You can find exceptions to this. What happens is the dad gives the son a Y chromosome and the mom gives the son X chromosomes. So it has to go from mom to son because the son picks up a Y chromosome from dad. Is it possible to go from mom to daughters? Yes, that's also possible. So this only thing, we can actually probably get rid of it.
even though this example here doesn't show it. But is it possible to go from father to sons? The answer is no, because the sons only pick up the Y chromosome from dad. A recessive one, on the other hand, gives us some other strange looking phenomena. So XX, XY, XX, XY, XY, XX, X, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, X, X. So what's going on here? Clearly I see that we're skipping, or actually here I don't see any generations being skipped, yet we can explain it using sex chromosomes. So here I want to say that's dominant, but there's a weird pattern. If you look, it's predominantly males who have it. Sex chromosome or X-linked recessives mainly affect males. Here's why. So this male has it, and what you have here is the mom is heterozygous. So both of these are given over, and then we have a daughter who is affected. This daughter who's affected has one X chromosome, and that X chromosome goes to those males. It doesn't matter which one it is, it goes to the males. But from the dad, the dad gives up a normal X chromosome to the daughters. So the daughters are heterozygous, and they don't show the trait. But the sons, who only have one X chromosome, they automatically show. So what we get is weird sets of patterns. Actually, it's not going to be next week. It's going to be part two. So we get all sorts of weird patterns that we can see inside of pedigrees. And it has to do with how X chromosomes pass on. So we say for the most part, females are XX and males are XY. Caveats still apply. But we're going to work those problems in part two. Lab is going to deal with meiosis and basic genetics. So everything we're doing this week online applies to lab. We're going to draw out meiosis, and then we're going to just work a whole bunch of different problems. We're going to test each other on some stuff. It'll be a hoot and holler in good time. And there's going to be lots of counting, just so you know, and probabilities. So, calculators ahoy. Next, we're going to look at all the ways that Mendel was wrong. <laughs>